All right, good, good, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, welcome to our faculty OER dialogue on English. Happy Open Education Week. Uh, this is Una Daly here from the Community College Consortium for OER, and we're so glad you could join us today. Um, I'm going to introduce our moderator and um, Regina Gong, who is the OER project manager at Lansing Community College. Uh, she's also been a longtime member of CCC OER and has been our um, Executive Council VP for professional development for the last two years. And it's, so I'm thrilled to introduce her and I will let her take it from here and introduce the amazing panelists we have this today for you. Thank you. Thank you, Una. And welcome to everyone joining us for our third day of our faculty OER dialogues celebrating our Open Education Week 2019. So we have three amazing English faculty with us today. And um, Lori Coleman is a college OER coordinator and professor of English at San Antonio um, College in Texas. And we have um, Catherine Lynch, who is the Associate Professor of English and Chair of the Sam Draper Honors Program at Rockland Community College in New York. And um, last but not least, Claire Thompson, who's also a Professor of English at Northern Essex Community College. So welcome, everyone. And, um, you know, this is a faculty conversation. So um, while we have some guiding questions, you know, really this is a dialogue amongst, you know, all of us and certainly um, among the three of you because a lot of our um, attendees now would want to learn from your experiences with using an OER in your courses. So let us start. So first, um, and you, you know, you can, there's no order by which you can answer this. Um, just tell us about um, what you're teaching, the courses um, that you're teaching, and um, just a little overview of um, the students in your college. So let's have Kate um, start. Okay. Great, uh, so I am here at Rockland Community College, uh, part of the SUNY system, one of the 64 campuses in the SUNY system. And I've been here since 2010, and my college be started to become interested in OER around 2016. Um, and so we formed an OER committee, um, and then we really started gathering our interest and, and sustaining that interest when um, Governor Cuomo of New York announced his Excelsior scholarship. And so um, for those of you not in New York, that is a tuition free college experience at the public universities and community colleges and other state colleges, um, as long as your income is within a certain, a certain range. And with that press release, he also announced an infusion of $8 million into the SUNY, the State University of New York and the CUNY, the City University of New York um, systems. And so that really motivated a lot of campuses within the SUNY system, which Rockland Community College is a part of, to, to start looking into using OERs. Um, I am, as announced, the chair of the honors program. And so I decided that we would start experimenting with OERs on our honors students because um, A, I have control of that, and B, uh, they are a very you know, bright crowd and they're very flexible and you can, you can sort of get their feedback while you're doing um, experimental work. And so what I started doing with a few colleagues is we looked at some available resources and we decided that we wanted to slowly begin developing our own resources. Um, and so what we've done for English in particular is we've looked into public domain texts as the readings for our English 101, our College Writing 1, and our English 102, our College Writing 2 courses. Okay. And so... Um, in addition to those public domain texts, we've built around them, uh, you know, material like a scholarly apparatus in a commercially published textbook. So, for example, introductions, textual annotations, um, discussion questions, reading and writing questions. And those questions and introductions and all of those materials were initially developed by faculty. But over time, we have really made a push toward an open pedagogical approach where 
those uh, materials are now more and more being developed by students. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's, we're right, right at the sort of cutting edge of that for our campus. It's not happening um, a lot, but it is happening a little bit. And so that to me is where the true magic of open lies, is in mm -hmm. open pedagogy, where you are having students become co-creators and co-collaborators with you in mm -hmm. doing this work of creating and curating open content. So okay. I'll just pause there and uh, happy to take any questions and of course talk more. Yeah, well, thank you, Katie. Um, and how about you, Claire? Can you tell us about, you know, what courses you've been teaching and how long have you been teaching with an OER? Okay. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, you can. Okay. So I teach um, English 101 and 102. I also teach uh, the first year seminar and I teach the RWR class, which is um, our developmental courses for students who um, need a little bit more support before they take a college level writing class. Um, and I started using OER when I uh, was accepted as part of the grant for the OER uh, consortium grant with Sue Tajan. I don't know if you know her from Northern yes. Uh -huh. so I worked with Sue uh, Tajan and Jody Carson, uh -huh. and they are the ones who got me involved with using open ed resources. So I've done two rounds of grants with them where um, I've been able to use the grant money to create OER materials for my comp one class. Okay. And when I created the materials for my Comp 1 class, of course, I was able to use it for my RWR classes as well. Um, okay. And when I teach writing in my first year seminar class, I use the um, OER materials as well. So okay. um, the types of uh, materials that I use, I've actually created a, a YouTube channel for the videos that I use. So instead of having um, a textbook, I created a series of YouTube, YouTube videos for my students. And then um, I recently created a sentence maker website for them to use uh, with it. It houses all of our um, sentence work that we do with our uh, workshops and things like that. And then, um, yeah, we have a website at school as well where it houses um, sample student essays. So as part of that website called The Writing Project, we also have a page which is OER materials that students or faculty or, or anyone who gets on the website can use. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I found that I'm using more and more of uh, the homemade kind of uh, materials in my classes rather than textbooks, um, or I use an open ed uh, textbook, especially uh -huh. in my first year seminar class. We have a, a textbook that I use okay. that's already, that's open, open ed resource already. Okay. Well, 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 thank you. Thank sure. you, Claire. And how about you, Laurie? Okay, sorry, I turned off. Oh, there it is. My mic was off. I thought it was off. Um, so I teach in Composition 1 and Composition 2, Technical Writing and the Second Half of American Literature at San Antonio College. And um, I've been a full-time faculty here for 20 years. And I was first introduced to OER back in 2016 when my five college district wide committee was tasked to revise our textbook guidelines to include OER. So um, that was when I first discovered this wonderful resource. And then um, we were one of the colleges, well, our district received the Achieving the Dream or OER grant. Mm -hmm. So we began as part of the Texas Consortium to really build toward a, um, a degree that's still uh, rough around the edges, but we have plans to, at our college, to really take what we've developed and really bring it further into development uh, starting this summer. Um, and then I, I think in terms of um, what I use, I really incorporate a lot of the OER licensed images into my online content for my courses. Um, then I also use the Sailor Academy Writer's Handbook. Uh, the majority though of the materials that I use are really no cost materials through my library. Uh, such as newspaper articles, full text literary works when I teach my literature courses. Uh, I link my students to the Purdue OWL website and to the Excelsior online writing lab for all the writing and reading resources that I want them to know about. Um, I use those images because I think that they are high quality and they're creative and I just don't have that skill set that I could do that. So that's why I enjoy using the um, the licensed images that I've 
uh, incorporated. And I like using the handbook because it provides my students with those reading and writing process strategies. Um, they get a lot of the uh, research writing information, and it even has support for the limited English proficient students in my classes, as well as help with grammar and usage. usage. So my process of adopting OER has really been a journey, and I can't remember where I actually started because so much has come to uh, onto my plate and on, on, on my horizon in terms of what's out there. Mm -hmm. But probably my... Um, initial endeavors were primarily with Merlot and Canvas Commons since Canvas is our LMS. Mm -hmm. But I think being on the CCC OER email listserv has really been the best investment uh, in terms of sharing knowledge and resource. But um, that, that's what I would say about that. Um, I don't know, if, uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, that, that's really what my process is has been. In terms of changing, things that have changed, I think that now that I've transitioned away from a publisher's text, I find that teaching the course has really been the same, uh, except that I don't have to give a lot of disclaimers for the for the corrections that are in the textbook that I that don't match how I teach writing and reading. And maybe the only other significant difference would be that I'm, I'm really more mindful about how my students are interacting with my instructional materials. Does my content come across clearly? Is the content what my students need to be successful in the course? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, thank you for addressing that, Lori, and I'd be interested to hear from both Katie and um, Claire about the process, because, you know, a lot of our faculty say that it's really, especially if you're revising and remixing uh, multiple OERs, it ends up more work than, you know, the creation or development. So. I'd be interested to learn, and I'm sure the other uh, participants too, um, about what the process was like for you in, in adopting or in the creation of OER. Um, so, oh, you oh, go ahead, Claire. Oh, okay. Um, I was going to say that it, it evolved over time. Um, I started off slowly, so I did a little bit at a time. So it wasn't like um, I just decided to completely go OER in one semester. I started building things and I realized I had a lot of materials already that if I tweak them a little bit more then I would be able to use them as full OER and I guess for me it took probably I don't if I had to guess maybe a year before I felt like I was ready to be a fully OER English 101 class. Mm -hmm. So for me, um, I was noticing that a large part of the textbook that we were using in College Writing One in particular included information and text that were in the public domain. So everything from you know Plato's Allegory of the Cave to um, you know to the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence to Douglas's narrative, you know things like that, where you don't have to pay seventy-five dollars to access these materials. You can pay nothing. Um, and so we started, my co colleagues and I started cobbling them together into modules or themed units. And the way that we did that was we would look at some texts that really spoke to each other around a theme. So for example, the theme of education would include a few of the texts I just mentioned, uh, Plato's Allegory of the Cave, Doug, Frederick Douglass's narrative. Then we move on to uh, Maria Montessori, whose work is in, in the public domain. And she's got that great metaphor of students being pinned to their desks like dead butterflies, which sort of echoes some of the slavery kinds of, you know, motifs that were going on in the other two texts. And then we moved on to John Dewey and Democracy in Education and excerpted that. And he actually cites Montessori. So we were developing these units that were really um, about connection. And we called our curriculum the only connect curriculum. And we wanted students to understand the text that they're reading as part of an extended conversation that they also should feel empowered to enter into. Uh -huh. So after developing a few of these units, um, we began working with them and teaching with them. And then to me, what's really changed about my teaching is this pretty new to me, at least, idea that I can have the students doing um, their own creation of course material. So I've actually mentored a student in an internship and he has gone on to, to develop in this internship an entire unit or module around the theme of ethics and literature. And he's doing it all with open texts and he's writing the curriculum materials. And when he's finished, you know, that's something that can be used by any English teacher, you know, at, at our college and elsewhere. 
And so that really puts the ownership of the curriculum in the hands of the student and uh, someone who is achieving an applied learning credits, you know, set of credits for their degree is also giving back to the college and enabling more teachers to use open materials. So I love that symbiotic relationship that comes yeah. with open pedagogy. Mm -hmm. and, and I think so that that also um, sends a message to the student that they are not just consumers. Correct. You know, of knowledge, they are co-creators and producers too. And also um, probably gives a, them a chance to start their scholarly communication work, you know, while they are still in school. And certainly they can use that after. Um, and I think many of you have, um, you know, mentioned about the process, but um, is there any change in the way you teach now that you are teaching with um, an OER? Hmm. I, I guess for me, I, I feel like I'm teaching to themes and ideas that are coming from me rather than a textbook or coming from my students rather than a textbook. So before I used OER, I would have a textbook and then kind of build my class around that textbook. And now, uh, now it's different. And so to think about what I think would be interesting to students or ask them what they think would be interesting. And then we build our class around that. So th that's one of the freedoms I think that comes with OER is that. Um, Laura, Lori, um, is there anything you would like to add about any changes in the way you teach the course now that you have adopted it? Um, I think I said uh, earlier that it really didn't change the way I teach my class. I never felt that the textbook was going to be the place that I drove my course. Not that that would be anything, there would be anything wrong with that. Yeah. But I, yeah, but I always had the sense that the textbook was just an ancillary, it was a tool, it was part of the skills and the knowledge that I wanted my students to be able to practice in my course. Mm -hmm. So it, the transition from a, a publisher's textbook to the open sources or things that, that I had to develop myself mm -hmm. really just kind of fell right in line with the objectives that I knew I had to accomplish by the end of the term. So the changes weren't um, anything more than really <laughs> You know, feeling confident, really feeling confident in that, oh, okay, I created a lot of the content myself now, and I, I think maybe I, and this may get to the challenges, but I think I, I didn't have as much confidence at the beginning that I could do that because mm -hmm. maybe I did see the textbook as a kind of crutch. Oh, I would just send my students to the textbook, read this chapter, or look at that example. But now I had to develop my own example or curate my examples from my students who were willing to give me permission to use examples. So I think that that may have been the impact in terms of change. Mm -hmm. I had to then go out and ask for things. And that was fun because um, I think it, it helped my students to feel like, wow, she wants to use my essay. I wouldn't tell them why. I wanted to use it necessarily. Um, I didn't want students to just have the, the excellent models of writing, but I wanted them to see the process and see what happens from beginning, middle, and, and end in terms of that writing process. So that was actually fun, getting to work with my students and helping to actually curate some of my content. Mm -hmm. And it's re interesting because there is an OER that was just launched last year, I believe. I don't know if you've heard about um, Empower empowered. So it's a student created um, OER, open textbook that is used in um, composition classes. So um, I'll put the link in the chat so you can take a look at it. And um, so before we move on to the next slide, I, I was just like, um, it, it's interesting because the thing that is most common among the three of you is that um, in your institution, they have some form of an OER grant or award, right? Mm -hmm. And so as I'm sure you know that not many institutions have that. And so my question is, is that like, um, how, how, what does that play in your decision to adopt an OER? I mean, it's not like, 
faculty are being paid millions, right? So I'm sure it's not that, but I'm interested, and maybe the others who are interested to know um, about the impact or the, that that grant has for, for, for you in your adoption of an OER. Okay, for uh, I'll I'll speak on our grant. So, the grant that we received was district wide. So we're five colleges. So there were multiple faculty who were involved and uh, in our district. But then there were two other or three other colleges um, that were also part of the grant. So you're you're right that there was money there, but it wasn't this you know windfall of any kind. So there had to be a certain um, process for the district to decide, well, which faculty would get that uh, funding to develop uh, their course. Um, it wasn't competitive because I think we were all just learning from the start. And luckily, it wasn't the kind of process that I've heard a lot of people have adopted is a proposal kind of process where you submit a proposal and you're, uh, you're either, you know, reviewed to say, yes, this is worthy of the time and, and funds that we're going to give you. It was really just kind of, I knew this person who was in charge of the grant and he had, we had worked on a committee um, from the district level. And so he knew that I was aware of OER. And the, th the same thing kind of happened. It was just word of mouth. And so that process probably is not going to be the same if we ever do another uh, huge grant like that. But um, I can't say that, honestly, I have to be honest here, I can't say that necessarily we maximize the potential of the funding. Um, because I did find from some of, and again, this might be a challenge, <laughs> but mm -hmm. some of my colleagues, um, not some, maybe one or two, um, felt a little bit out in the dark, like, well, why didn't I know about it? What, you know, what happened to the money and, and what do we have to show for it? And I think that those are valid questions. So I know that that is something that we as, a, as an institution are probably going to take into account going forward. Thank you, Lori. Mm -hmm. Katie, you have? Sure. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, you know, part of our OER initiative really came from, from the governor's office, um, and our campus decided that we wanted to really get on that. So, not every school within the system has been um, as sort of progressive and forward thinking as fortunately our campus. We have an OER committee that is staffed predominantly by faculty throughout several disciplines. The provost sits on that committee and she has voice but no vote on anything. Um, she's there to kind of, you know, advise us and then to be aware of any changes that we're recommending. And that committee is a great group. Um, we've also been given a lot of air time by our administration at things like our faculty startups before each semester to try to spread the word. So it really does help to have that institutional support and we've seen a lot of momentum in OER as a result. I would say though that I'm a firm believer in OER being you know, sort of adopted slowly if necessary. So you can do this in bite-sized increments. You can start with just one assignment or one part or one unit in your mm -hmm. course that's OER. You can start with just extra credit that involves making OER. Um, and then slowly with the help of your students and your, and your administration, you can really, and other faculty, of course, you can really move from there. So I think one, one takeaway that I would offer to anyone who is thinking of getting started here is you don't have to do it all in one fell swoop. You can start slowly and make progress slowly over time, and you're still going to be doing so much good for your students. Um, if I could add something to that. Um, one of the things that our school, I'm sure your school does it as well, but one of the things that our school does is it indicates on the uh, banner when students register for classes, there's a pop-up that lets them know this is an OER class. And so um, a lot of my students are actually paying attention to that now. They're like, oh, this is one of those OER classes where I'm not going to have to spend a ton of money on, um, on books or, or things like that. And I feel like that's, I, I feel like my institution is doing a great job of supporting us both with grant money to give you, um, you know, I guess uh, to value the time that you're putting into creating and sharing your materials, but also um, spreading the word so that students are um, becoming more aware of when OER, pro when OER classes are available to them. And, and at my school, there are more and more of them, which I think is great. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. So let's go to, okay, the next slide. It's not um, advancing, but we have copies of the um, questions. So I would just like to um, 
uh, know from your experience, how has your students um, responded to the use of OER in their class? Um, and and Lori has mentioned this that you know she finds or she found that the students are more engaged with the, the course and the class. But um, maybe you should maybe you can talk about how you know your students has uh, have responded to this and what are the assessment that you have done in order to measure their success rates in the course okay so i'll, I'll go first so we have not done and i have not done i should say my college has not done nor have i done any formal assessments regarding our student success rates in our courses that use no cost materials, but my district is looking at this for our future work because we know it's important. Um, but anecdotally, we really believe that there may not be monumental differences in progressive grades or completion, since most of the faculty who practice this uh, open pedagogy are all already those who are innovative teachers, who already have high PGR and high uh, student success. So. Um, that's kind of where, where we believe we are, but of course everyone likes data and they like to do analysis of data. So again, we, we are looking into how we can uh, do a better job of, of making our assessments clear with regards to the student success in our courses. Um, my students don't really respond very much to the instructional materials in the course in terms of giving me feedback like, hey, that was really great or that was really useful, but they never did in the first place. Oh. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I mean never, but in general, in general, I never, I, I didn't, rem I don't remember getting students feedback uh, in real time, maybe on our end of course surveys, but in real time, I didn't, I didn't get a lot of feedback from students saying, oh, this book is the best book ever. They would simply maybe say to me, well, uh, I found this chapter useful because I'm, I'm rusty on XYZ. Um, and, and the same would be the case for my current courses now that I've transitioned trans trans <laughs> away from the publisher textbook. It's pretty much the same. My students might say, oh, this resource that you gave me was very helpful. Um, I had a problem with the comma splices and I, I looked at the examples and, and it helped me. Um, and then, you know, it just varies from semester to semester. I don't see a pattern with it, but I know that my students um, in general prefer, in general, and there are always those exceptions, in general prefer that, that whatever the content I'm using for the course, that it's available online or mm. to have it printed, they have an option. But for the most part, I, I think that, that the, the hard printed version of the materials is not a, a, a big demand by my students right now. Mm -hmm. I think I could add to that too. Um, one of the things I noticed about my students is that they, they appreciate that they can be first day ready, so they don't have to wait for their book vouchers to come in. Um, they don't have to borrow money from somebody to get an expensive book and all that. Um, so they're first day ready, the very first, from the moment they walk in the class, they're ready to go. They don't need to worry about, um, like I said, getting their book voucher money and things like that. So I feel like that's a big stress reliever for my students. A lot of them um, are surprised. Some of them didn't realize they signed up for a class that had OER and they're usually grateful um, and happy when they find out that they don't have to buy an expensive book and that they can start reading or doing the assignments right away. Mm -hmm. That's one, one way I noticed that my students have um, responded. And I'm not sure, I might have to ask Sue or Jody if we've done any kind of assessment. Um, but anecdotally, I feel like my students are better prepared because they don't have to wait for their textbooks to come, or if they can never get them during the semester, they don't have to go to the library and read the book in the library and return it back to the reference desk. Um, mm -hmm. So those are two ways I think I've noticed mm -hmm. my students responding to the text. Okay, great. Katie, do you have anything to add? Sure. So um, it isn't the most formal assessment, but we did a survey um, where essentially we used some of our OER committee money to buy a bunch of pizzas and then <laughs> had students sign disclaimer forms and take the survey and have a slice of pizza as long as they were 18 or older. And what we learned from that, so we had students who, um, who were in OER classes and who were not. And what we learned is that, um, at least on our campus, most of the students really just want the cheapest possible textbook option. Um, and so that sort of helped us make the case to other faculty members for using OER. As to whether students are doing better in those OER classes or if they're persisting, um, we don't, I don't yet have any information on that. Although I do know that achieving the dream 
has uh, published, I think late last year, they uh, published a little uh, article that referred to a study that did demonstrate that um, especially low income students are absolutely using the money they save on textbooks to do other things that they need to do in their lives. And so that to me is right there, proof positive that we are absolutely doing the right thing. Um, in terms of how my students, my own students have responded, most of the response has been positive. We use an educational technology platform called PanOpen. Um, hmm. There are many, many ed tech programs out there, pieces of software that can deliver open content that have bells and whistles that are very useful. And PanOpen's most useful um, uh, sort of uh, feature for my purposes is public annotation of a text. So hmm. for example, I can put an excerpt from Plato's Symposium up there on PanOpen and the students are annotating it publicly, meaning that they are you know, sharing comments in the margins of that text online. And that is extraordinary to watch because a conversation is happening in the margins of the text. Mm -hmm. They love that, uh, I love that, but there are of course always some bugs to work out. So the flip side of that is that sometimes the annotations aren't working properly or something like that. But for the most part, I haven't received student complaints. Um, and if they do want to print the textbook, they can. There are many low cost print options such as Amazon, CreateSpace, and Lulu. So there's, there's yeah. lots of ways to get a printed version, even if the content is being delivered online. Mm -hmm. Great. And, and now that you've, you've had a chance to use OER um, in your courses for you know, a few semesters, do you think there might be some changes that you'd like to implement um, as a result of the feedback and um, the experiences that you've had with teaching the course? Well, I think hearing, um, hearing the others uh, on the panel speaking, I would like to, when I move forward with this, I'd like to do more with having my students create their own uh, OER materials. So I think, I think OER gives you an opportunity to evolve as a teacher in, in so many creative ways. So I'm looking forward to that going forward. <laughs> Yeah, I think I, I agree. I think that the, the process is never ending. It, there's, it's a journey. It's not a destination. I mean, there's always room for improvement in my courses. There's always uh, important feedback that my students give me about, you know, just the, the, the basic things regarding this link didn't work, Professor Coleman. I can't get to this resource. <laughs> so again, that's one of the things I have to be mindful of is that I have to be diligent, make sure that everything I link out from my, my course that I want my students to use as a tool or resource needs to work. And so um, I think that constant communication with my students to tell them, look, um, I'm not perfect and this course is not perfect. So we have to communicate. And, and I, I'm enjoying that, that level of kind of uh, reciprocity. You know, they're, they're taking care of me and I'm taking care of them. So I like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think that is good, Lori, because um, as what I've advised our faculty here at LCC too, you know, just let the students know that this material is not set in stone, that this material is changing. If you find some errors or if you find that this section doesn't make sense, you can let you know, the, the faculty know and they can change it. And students were like, yeah, you can change it right then. Yes, we can. And to them, it's a paradigm shift because they're so used to the textbook, right? And yes. the, the, the new edition is the one that will get changed. So, but usually they have to pay more, right? So, yeah. anyways, <laughs> yeah, so, um, so we're nearing the end of our um, faculty conversation. I want time for us to, um, you know, have a conversation with the other uh, participants, have a chance to ask you questions. But before that, um, would you have any advice? Of course you have, right? Takeaways, words of wisdom, things that you know now that you didn't know before and all those things that you like. Um, our faculty to know. Yeah, I, I think Katie made a good point when she mentioned how you really should, if you're just endeavoring to start your journey, is take it slow and find maybe one lesson or one assignment or, or 
one example that you use in your course and see if you can transition that into an open source. Um, it's, it can be overwhelming and I think we, we need to be mindful that, that it is time consuming in some cases uh, because you, you're, you're now really customizing your course content. And I, I know about when I do this, I want the best. I want the best for my students. And so I, it sometimes takes some vetting and it just takes time to either find that or create it yourself. So I think, yeah, give yourself some time. And then um, the other thing I would say is, um, you know, use your successes to build on your confidence and every small success can do that for you. Um, take advantage of the people who've gone before you and reach out to them for guidance. If your college has professional development, um, you know, reach out and take advantage of those opportunities. And then finally realize that you know, you're potentially leaving behind some kind of a legacy for the future students of your college and the faculty. If you decide you want to license some of the work that you've uh, created along your journey. So I think that that's very powerful. Mm -hmm. I also, I wanted to add a little bit to that as well as um, one of the things I did with OER is I was trying my best anyway, to pay attention to how the students like to receive information. Mm -hmm. um, they love videos. They love, uh, things that move and things like that. So with OER, you're able to sort of take a risk and um, deliver the, the material in different ways. So um, I guess I would encourage anyone who's about to try this is to uh, take some risks and try some other forms of media, like whatever whatever your students are into, see if you can learn how to use that media yourself to sort of to create some of the materials that you might use in your class or have them use that material to create uh, the things in your class as well. And just to piggyback off what, what Claire just said, you know, you can get your students to join you in this conversation. That would be my biggest takeaway. They, they need to be a part of it from the ground up, from the first conversation to the, to the most recent one. And they will help you understand what they need. And then they can also help you fill those needs and do that in ways that actually enrich their own learning process. So mm -hmm. I think it's really important that we're always listening to our students very intentionally and very closely and then inviting us to collaborate as we try to do this good work. Good points, really, everyone. And so I'd like to open up the, the, the floor for questions from our participants. Um, Una, do we have questions from the chat box? Uh, there were a couple of comments slash questions. Um, someone mentioned um, that they were surprised that the Sailor Academy Writer's Handbook uh, was OER. And um, I didn't see any response in there, but um, as, uh, my understanding is that Sailor Academy, all of their um, materials are openly licensed and have been since the beginning. So mm -hmm. I, um, I think that uh, you can rest assured that that's available for you. And um, secondly, there was a great question here from Kelsey Smith about the use of modern novels in their courses, which of course are copyrighted. And um, Katie responded, I'm gonna let Katie respond uh, verbally if she would, um, because the chat window doesn't often get distributed with the video. And so yeah. I thought Katie's answer was, was terrific. Okay, so um, this is of course, you know, I'm trained as a medievalist, so, I'm okay with everything being in the public domain from my own period, but that's not true for many of us. And we want to teach our students contemporary novels or modernist novels or poetry, things that are, you know, very much copyrighted and those authors deserve the money that they receive. Um, so what SUNY has said is that a SUNY OER course involves 51% of, of content that's open. That means that you can tack on, you know, a collected volume of poems or a recent play or a novel um, or two. And as long as that's not the majority of the course, that's okay by SUNY. All I would say is that doing combinations like that, even if you're not in a system that has some sort of mandate, just doing a combination like that is perfectly fine and will work very well, especially if the book is readily available in the library, um, in public libraries and in the school library, mm -hmm. and then just making sure that you order the book so that students who can use financial aid to pay for their books can use that money to do it. And then, you know, Amazon has cheap options often and, and other places as well. So that's been a solution um, for, for me. Uh, and I think that's worked for other people as well. And then one other way to think about it is that you can have your students generating uh, some of the other ancillary information, like if you ordered a novel, 
uh, and you wanted students to write an introduction to that novel and questions about that novel and, and mm -hmm. things like that, you could have them do that and openly license that content mm -hmm. because it's not the novel itself. And you'd still be getting them to create uh, OERs with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, and and in addition, um, I do the same, Katie. I, I do have my students purchase one novel um, that's less than twenty dollars. But we have on our library access to Lit Finder, the Gale database Lit Finder. I'm not sure if that's something that other people have been using, but there are contemporary poems and short fiction in there um, from you know Alice Walker. Um, I can't, I can't think of all the ones that I've seen there, but they're contemporary. They're, they're not medieval, but they're, I'm sure there's some medieval ones there too. Um, but I don't think that I've seen uh, that Lit Finder has full novels there. They, it does have The Awakening. I, I do use The Awakening because it is in Lit Finder, um, but I haven't actually searched for really more contemporary than that. So um, I, would, I would ask the, or I would recommend that you ask your uh, reference librarians if they have if you do have access to the Lit Finder, because it's a wonderful lifesaver for me in terms of the literature. Mm -hmm. And I think I do the same. I have my um, students do buy um, an inexpensive novel. Uh, for my World Lit class right now, they're reading two novels and they were both under $15. So the total cost for the class was about $20, but the books are also are readily available at the local library and at our college library. Um, and as um, I think it was Katie mentioned, Amazon has some great options where sometimes you can buy that book for a dollar. So I kind of scope it all out and see where can students get these novels and books and things that I want to use that are not OER yet. So, um, so I would say my class is probably about 75% OER and then the rest is going to be like one small purchase so that we're all reading the same book and all that. And you know, the great thing about using library resources like Lit Finder or we have EBSCO eBooks, which does, you know, you may have that as well. It does cover a fair number of texts is that you're also teaching your students information literacy by mm -hmm. steering them toward that, that resource. So you're also embedding a, another learning outcome in there and teaching them how to find material in their own library, which is great. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, thank, you. I'm yeah, sorry. thank you for, for putting the plug for library as a librarian myself. Yes, I mean, utilize your library resources because we are paying for it anyway institutionally. So we can um, make like arrangements for you know faculty to use our ebooks and make it multi-user or um, a limited license. So yes, make use of your library resources as part of your OER course. Yeah. And I'm sorry, I I who was that that I'm sorry, I was just also mentioning when um when we were talking about the poems, I don't know if it was Claire or Katie, but mm -hmm. I also um, use the poets.org website and the Poetry Foundation website as well for contemporary poems. Yeah, that, that's a great site. I get like the poet a day daily yes. uh, <laughs> thing delivered yeah. to my email. Yeah. So Una, do we, do we have any more questions? Uh, there, weren't any, there weren't any more questions, but um, somebody brought up the um, hypo hypothesis tool mm -hmm. and their use. And I don't know if Claire or someone else would like to speak to that. I, I'm not sure who's using that, but it's, it's, it's an annotation tool. Yes. Yeah. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not using that tool. Okay, uh -huh. maybe That's someone awesome. else would. Like yeah, it. yeah, I think I had typed that in the chat box and I just started experimenting with it this um, semester. Um, there's a learning curve, but it's a Chrome extension that you add to your uh, browser. Uh, I don't think they have the extensions for the other browsers, not that I know of, but um, it, it it's, can be very useful for when your students are maybe um, struggling with the content and you can leave annotations online, you can share them, you can create groups for different works that you're studying. Uh, they can be saved to your group so people can go back and look at them. Uh, but again, I'm just getting my feet wet with it. So um, I haven't used it enough to really give it a five stars yet because <laughs> I think it's still a little bit of a learning curve for, for me and my students. That's great. Um, I think I can add one other thing that I, since I've been doing OER, or actually probably before, but um, I love using the NPR.org. They have some really uh, great materials there for teachers and for students. So right now, um, my students are, one class is writing a kind world story. 
And then they're doing research about kindness. So um, a lot of the articles about kindness that we use came from our library databases. But the um, Kind World Stories on NPR, uh, you know, WBUR.org, um, those were great. It was like a, a treasure trove of a bunch of different uh, Kind World Stories that they can learn from. And then we do uh, This I Believe from NPR as well. And they have a whole uh, section available for educators. It gives them all kinds of uh, resources for teaching that um, particular assignment. So I'm finding that there's a lot of uh, cool online places like the Rumpus and places like that where you can get some free essays and some uh, supporting materials for introducing those types of essays into your classes. You probably already know about that stuff, but I love all that stuff. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, thank you. Thank you for, you know, this wonderful conversation that we've just had. I wish we had more time. So, but um we have i think your um um emails do we have do we have their emails so that if people want to connect more with katie claire or Lori, they can be contacted would that be okay absolutely for, for the three of you yeah yeah, definitely. yeah so thank you thank you for for your time and thank you for the wonderful conversation that we've had but before I let you go, I have some plug that I need to do for CCC OER. Um, we have another, um, let me see. My, my email, okay, great. There you go. Okay, so just want to, to let you know of some of our upcoming conferences. If you go to the cccoer.org um, website, and um, in, the, in the tab that says get involved, you'll see upcoming conferences in there. And also, as what Lori mentioned earlier, the community email is really a treasure trove of information. Um, it's a community of practice. We strive hard to um, make it so that everyone um, who, you know, who has a question about the OER or wanting to find an OER for a particular discipline, or if you have any questions, um, I mean, a lot of us who participate in there um, really aim to, to um, be of help to everyone in the community. So if you have not um, signed up yet to the CCCO OER community email, please do so. And we have two more faculty conversations slated um, for tomorrow and Friday. So if you go to the website, you'll find and you can register for um, tomorrow and Friday's conversations. So thank you again to everyone and thank you to our faculty featured speaker for today. We really appreciate your insights, your experience. And I hope this has been helpful. So thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. you, Regina. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.